So in this Blender tutorial, I'm going to show you how you'd go about making a HAL 9000 model. And really the purpose of this tutorial is seeing the whole workflow necessary to create an asset from scratch. So we're going to start off with the modeling to create a base mesh, and you can see that the geometry here is pretty simple. We're then going to UV unwrap this, which isn't super important because the majority of our shading will be procedural. Speaking of shading, we're then going to create some simple shaders using a bunch of nodes. And finally, we're just going to add some volumetrics that look nice with our lighting. And if everything goes well, by the end of this, we're going to have a cool render that captures the creepiness of how. And a couple things to mention before we begin. First of all, this is a dense intermediate tutorial, so you may or may not need to pause throughout. Secondly, we're only going to need two images to work with, where one of them is just a reference and the other is the HAL 9000 logo, which we'll be using for texturing. Both these images will be available in the description so that you can work alongside this video. But now that we're ready, let's hop into Blender and get started. So in our default scene, we can delete everything and head over to the side view. And before we begin any of our modeling, we want to import in our reference. To do this, add a background image and choose the HAL 9000 reference image. This imports in our reference, which has all the information we need for the modeling. Now add in a plane oriented to the view so it's facing us and enable x-ray mode so we can see through to our reference. And what we're going to do here is essentially outline this image with our plane. So scale down the y-axis until these align and stretch out the plane on the z-axis. We can then add in some loop cuts with Control R and slide them along the plane so they match the metal outline. For the horizontal direction, we'll need four of these and we still need to take care of the vertical component. To do this, add a loop cut down the middle and then bevel it out with Control B. And since beveling is a symmetric operation, this will place the cuts correctly on both sides. Now the next thing we need to account for is the metal outline has rounded corners. To make our plane do this, first select the four corner vertices with shift clicking and then we can hit Control B to bevel and also hit V to enable vertex mode. And make sure to add a lot of segments so our rounding doesn't look jagged. Now that we've beveled the corners, we should have two overlapping vertices coming from each of the corners. To get rid of these, we can just select the whole mesh and run a merge by distance. And again, this just merges any pair of vertices that are sufficiently close together. So now we have a clean cross section of the HAL frame and we want to give this some depth. So let's extrude everything along the z-axis until it feels like the right thickness, and then with our two inner panels, we can extrude slightly inwards. Now this already looks pretty good as our base, but whenever you're going for realism, you should always avoid sharp corners. For example, with the loop running along the front side of the mesh, we want to add a small bevel with one segment. And again, not only does this look better, but it also creates a new edge that will catch the light later on. So we want to keep doing this type of thing all over our mesh. Another place we can do this is with our inner panels. So select the two inner edge rings and then bevel with a high enough segment count so we get these nice rounded panels. With a bunch of control clicking, we can select the front loops of both these panels and also add a slightly rounded bevel here. And now that we've added all the small details, we can head back to our side view and start working on our next piece. So the next mesh I want to work on is the metal ring in the center along with the glowing part of the lens. To make this, we can just add in a circle oriented to our view and fill this in with a triangle fan set at a high vertex count. We then want to bring this down so it's centered on the lens and also scale it down until it's outlining the metal. And you can see that this metal ring has some depth to it, which will be really easy to recreate. So in edit mode, and set all the faces until they reach the top loop of the metal, and then inset again until they reach the inner loop. Then in the perspective view, we can bring this loop outwards along the x-axis, and of course add a slightly rounded bevel. The last thing we need to do here is bring the outer loop back a bit so it's not at the same depth as the center of the lens. This will become important in a bit when we attach the piece to our frame. So now that we have our base and our metal ring, the last thing we need to make is the spherical glass of the lens. So let's add in a UV sphere oriented to our view with a high enough segment count so it doesn't look jagged. We then want to bring this down to the center and scale this down until it's outlining only the inner part of the lens. And really what we need from this is only the front hemisphere so in wireframe mode we can delete the back half. And what we need to remember is that we'll eventually apply a glass shader to this which won't look correct unless the mesh has some thickness. So what we can do is use extrude along normals to give this whole mesh a bit of thickness. However this introduces a new issue. If we look at our normals you can see that they're not really behaving correctly. And this is because our extrusion actually flip their orientation. So to fix this, we can just run a flip normals and now everything is working like we'd expect. So now we've modeled the three pieces that make up how and we just need to put them together. This just means we need to bring back our lens components so they're barely overlapping with our base. And remember that the glowing part of the lens is slightly further out than our base because of how we modeled the metal ring before. So now all that's left to do is enable smooth shading for all of these and to fix the glitchy shading, we can just enable auto smooth set to 30 degrees for each component. 
component. Now that we're done with the modeling, let's head over to the UV editing workspace for the next step. So the next step in making this asset is UV unwrapping. Now this isn't entirely necessary for this project since we'll be using mostly procedural shaders, but it's still something nice to go over. So before we begin unwrapping, we of course need to select all our objects and apply object transform. This is just to ensure we don't get any weird stretching later on with our unwrap. We're gonna begin with our base and we wanna start thinking about where to place our seams. So one obvious choice for this is selecting the loop going around the back and this is because the whole back area is one planar surface. We can then then also select this loop we got from the beveling we did before and also make that a seam. Now we want to isolate the very front of this frame and we can do that by making a barrier around our panels. So we can make this outer loop from the lower panel a seam and we also want to make the outer loop from the top panel also a seam. The last section we need to consider is the interior of these panels and we can easily take care of this by placing seams around our n-gons. So basically what we've done here is divided up our mesh into islands separated by our seams. And the last thing we need to take care of of are any islands that are essentially big loops. And we need to take care of these because otherwise we won't be able to flatten them out nicely. So for this one, we can just add a seam in the corner of the frame and for the panel loops, we can do pretty much the same thing. And those are all the seams we'll need for this so we can begin actually unwrapping. So let's hover the cursor over the back island and click L to select it. And with this one, we can simply hit U and run a simple unwrap, which we can then move out of the way. Now, if you wanna see the rest of our geometry, we can just hit the sync button, which will help us keep organized. So the next down to take care of is this large loop going around our frame. And for this one, we can again hit U and run a simple unwrap, which will move out of the way. The next region to take care of is the front of the base, which you can see is not perfectly planar. This means that if we try to run an unwrap, it's going to come out somewhat distorted. And the reason this is happening is that Blender is trying to minimize both the angle and area-based distortions, and this is the best result it generates. Instead, what we can do is hit U, but this time run a Q projection. And this gives us what is essentially a frontal projection at the cost of some area distortion. This isn't the optimal solution, but it's good enough for what we're doing. The next regions to unwrap are the panels. And since these are planar surfaces, we can run either a normal unwrap or a Q projection, either will work. Finally, we need to take care of the panel loop, so I'm gonna select the top loop and run a normal unwrap. Now, something you're gonna notice is that this island comes out somewhat curved, and we really wanna avoid this and strain out the island into a long strip. So there's an easy way to fix this, but it's a bit convoluted. So the first step is choosing a face inside this island that we want to straighten out. And to do this, we'll scale the bottom two vertices to zero on the y-axis and then do the same for the top two. And really all we're doing here is aligning these vertex pairs on the y-axis. Next, we need to do the same type of thing for the vertical pairs, but this time we'll scale to zero on the x-axis. So what we've done is strained out one of the faces in the island, which we'll now use to align the rest. To do this, select our face and then the rest of the island with L, and then finally just right-click and choose Follow active quads. And you can see this did exactly what we wanted. So now we can follow the same procedure on the bottom loop, and again we're just unwrapping it, choosing a face in the island and straining it out, and then finally running follow active quads. And at this point we have all our islands flattened, and now we need to pack them into our UV space. Again, we're not going to worry too much about optimizing this because we'll mostly be dealing with procedurals. So let's start off by moving our front island into the UV space, and you can see that this has two holes for our panels. What we can do with this is pack our island island panels into these gaps. So just do the best you can to center these and scale them down enough to prevent overlap. Next, we're going to take our back island and rotate it by 90 degrees so it's oriented the same way, and then we just want to move this next to our other islands. We can then align our strips side by side and scale them down so they all fit inside the UV space. And before moving on to the next mesh, let's tightly pack our islands together to finish this unwrap. So we've now finished unwrapping the base, which was actually the hardest part, and we can move on to the other two components. So let's Let's switch over to our metal ring and go into edit mode. For this one, what we want to do is separate the metal border from the center of the lens. And we can easily do that by selecting this loop and marking that as a seam. Now remember that whenever we have a loop as an island, we'll have some trouble flattening it out. So again, what we can do is add a seam somewhere across, and now we'll have a working unwrap. And just like last time, we want to strain this island out into a strip. So just strain out one of the faces in the island and do our follow active quads. And to pack everything together, we can scale down our planar surface 
circle and fit in our metal strip. This isn't the most optimal solution, but again, we're not going to need to worry about it. So now let's finish up by unwrapping our glass hemisphere, which should actually be the easiest. And what I'm thinking for this one is separating the glass into three islands. We'll have the outer glass, the inner glass, and the circular strip in between. And to get that kind of separation, we can just select these two edge loops and mark those as seams. So now when we select everything and run an unwrap, we get the three islands that we expected. And that's really all we have to do for the unwrapping step, so now let's head over to the shading window to begin creating some materials. Now shading is where things usually tend to get a bit complicated, so we want to keep everything simple and use as few nodes as possible. And before we can even begin making our materials, we need to create an environment to work in. So in the world shading, we'll change our background color to pure black, which we can see in the rendered view. And before we add any lights so we can see what's going on, let's first switch over to cycles so we're working with a more physically accurate render engine. And now we can add in an area light, which will move and rotate so it's illuminating our mesh. To make this a bit brighter, go over to the light settings and with using nodes we can bump up the strength, and to get softer shadows we'll increase our light size and then we can position this a bit to the side so it's not facing the mesh head on. Now all the lighting prep we just did is going to let us work on our shaders in a very nicely lit environment. So now that everything is set up, let's actually start making some materials. Starting off with our lens hemisphere, we obviously want this to have a glass shader of some kind. So create a new material for this which we'll name glass, and we can swap out the principled BSDF with a simple glass shader hooked up to the surface output. And since we don't want this glass to be completely clear, we should add some roughness that will make it a bit more frosted. And really, that's all we need for our glass shader to get a fairly realistic look, and we can move on to the other component of the lens. So again, create a new material for this which we'll call metal, and this time we'll use the principled BSDF as our main shader. Obviously, we want to make this fully metallic, and I'm also going to bump up the roughness a bit so our reflections become a bit blurrier. And at this point, there are two things we should note before continuing. First of all, you can see we've applied our metal material to this whole mesh, even though we only want it on the rim. And we'll fix this later on by overlaying another material, but for now you can just ignore the circular center. The other thing we need to address is that the metal rim looks flat shaded. And to fix this, all we have to do is increase our auto smooth angle, which will smooth all of this out. So now we're ready to keep working on our metal shader. And since this looks pretty plain as is, what we want to do is add some detail in the form of scratches. We'll do this by adding a musgrave texture, and we can view this by control shift clicking the node. This is a feature of the node wrangler add-on, so if you don't have it enabled, make sure that you enable it because we'll be using some other shortcuts like these. And for our Musgrave texture, we want to use the UV coordinates that we spent a while setting up. So with our node selected, hit Ctrl T to automatically add in a texture coordinates node and a mapping node. And what we want to do with these is hook up our UV coordinates instead of our generated ones. And now we can bump up the Musgrave scale to effectively make this noise very small. And to turn these into scratches, all we need to do is elongate them by shrinking our scale on the Y axis. So the reason we spent so much time unwrapping before is because now we benefit from the scratches perfectly going around the metal rim. And to incorporate these into our main shader, we can add in a bump node and feed the factor into the height. What the bump node is doing here is converting our black and white pattern into normal data that will feed into our principled BSDF. So just connect this output into our normal socket, and when we view the BSDF, it's clear that we should bring down the normal strength. Another detail we can add in with these scratches is having them slightly change the color of the metal. To do this, add in a color ramp node with the factor as the input, and hook this up to the color socket of the BSDF. And clearly we're getting inverted colors here, so to fix this, just swap the positions of the black and white handles. So what we're seeing here is that anywhere there's a scratch, the metal will dip to black. And even though this is the right idea, it looks way too harsh for our metal, so let's change the black color to a light gray. And this completes our simple metal material for the rim of the lens, and now we can address getting rid of it in our circular center. So in the material tab, we want to add another slot, and create a new material for this which I'll call emissive. And we're going to use this material to make Hal's red glowing eye, which will override the metal in the center. To get this material to overlap the metal, just go into edit mode, select the triangle fan in the center, and hit assign material. We can now delete this principled BSDF, which makes our center circle black. Our objective is now to turn this material into the red glowing eye, which means we need some kind of radial falloff that we can color red, orange, and yellow. A good place to start is with the gradient node with the dropdown set to spherical. And this creates the circular pattern we want, but obviously it isn't centered. 
centered. To fix this, hit Control T, which again adds these extra nodes, and we'll swap out the generated coordinates for our UV coordinates. Now you can either manipulate the mapping node by setting the X and Y locations to minus 0.5, which will center our gradient, but what I think is more intuitive is manipulating our UVs directly. So let's open up the UV editor window and drag our circular island roughly to the bottom left corner. And in UV coordinates, this corner is considered the origin, so effectively this will center our gradient. And the problem with using the location-based node solution is that if we wanted to scale our pattern, the mapping node would do that with respect to the original origin, and that won't keep the gradient centered. However, with this method, you can see that scaling up our sliders keeps everything centered and works perfectly. And if we want to change the look of this falloff, we can simply do that by adding in a math node to our graph set to power. And by picking a very large exponent, like 4 for example, we're going to get a very smooth falloff. To compensate for this falloff, we can just bring our scale sliders down to make our gradient larger. Now before we use this falloff to get any color, we need to make sure we can refer to our reference. And even though we're in the side view, you can see that a reference image has for some reason disappeared. And the reason we can't see it is because when we ran apply object transform, it reoriented our background image. So choose the reference empty in the outliner and bring it over to the side so we can rotate it to face our view. And now that we have our reference back, our goal is to use our generated falloff to try to match this color gradient. To do this, add in a color ramp node and we can clearly see white represents the center of the circle and black represents the outskirts. So since we need yellow in the middle, choose the second handle and use the eyedropper tool to sample this color. Now to add in some red, we can add another handle and use the eyedropper tool to sample from the reference. And we're going to do the same type of thing for orange by adding a handle that should be in between the red and the yellow colors and then we just sample the orange. And to mimic the reference the best we can, we want to adjust our sliders until our falloff matches more closely. So we're focusing on things like the size of the yellow pupil and where the red dips to black, and to better match this, let's again smooth out our gradient by increasing our exponent and compensate for this by adjusting our scale sliders. With only a bit more tweaking, we get something that actually matches pretty well, and we want to use this as the color for our emission. So just add an emission node to our graph hooked up to the surface output and play around with the strength until we get the right intensity for our lens. So now all that's left to shade is the base of Hal, and we want to start off with the metal material we created before. Now note that when we compare our shading with the reference, our metal doesn't seem to be bright enough. And this isn't actually a problem with our metal shader, but rather it's showing us that the lighting doesn't match very well. So by increasing the strength of our area light, we can see that we're getting metal that's much closer to our reference. And of course, we still need to make a black material for the top panel, so in the material tab, add another slot with a new material we can call black. To get this applied to our top panel, we again go into edit mode, select the top end gone, and with our new material selected, hit assign material. And for our shader, we can swap out the principled BSDF with just a diffuse BSDF set to a very dark gray. And the reason we don't need this principled shader is because I want this material to be fairly matte black without any fancy extra properties. Now to give this just a bit of depth, let's add in a Musgrave texture with a very large scale that we can use for a normal map. Again, we convert this by adding in a bump node hooked up to the normal socket, and we want to use our factor as the height input. And even though this is fairly hard to see, we want this normal map to be pretty subtle with a fairly low strength. So we could say this material is already good enough, but it's always good to add surface imperfections like dust, for example. To do this, we'll duplicate our diffuse BSDF with Shift D and choose a shade of yellow that kind of looks like dust. And of course, we need to find a way to blend these two together in some way that makes sense. And since dust usually accumulates in the creases of objects, we can use an ambient occlusion node to control our mixing. So add in a mix shader with our black BSDF as the foreground and use the ambient occlusion node as our factor. And already we can see the dust is showing up in a way that makes some physical sense. To get more control over this, let's add in a math node to our graph and start playing around with the value we're adding. And what we're doing here is increasing the factor input, which makes the foreground appear more in this mixing, and because of this, the dust becomes more subtle. And generally, these types of details we're adding in here will really pay off if we ever choose to do some close-up renders. Now, the final thing we need to add to the shader is our HAL 9000 logo. And to do this, add an image texture node with our logo image imported. So by control shift clicking this node, we can see it in our viewer, and clearly we need to mess around with some texture coordinates to get this mapped correctly. And just like last time, we can hit control T to add in a texture coordinates node along with a mapping node where our UV coordinates are already being used. And by increasing the scale on the mapping node, we can clearly see that this texture is set to tile. But of course, we only want one copy of our logo. To get rid of all these extra copies, we can just switch repeat mode over to clip mode. And now we need to start messing with our UV coordinates to get our logo to be positioned at the top of the panel. So in the UV editor, we want to bring the top panel island 
over to the bottom left corner, which again is the origin of our UV space. And now that the image is showing up on the mesh, we just need to mess around with our mapping node to get this in the right position. And this just involves changing our location and scale sliders until everything is matching up closely with our reference. And once we've mapped the logo to the top of the panel, we want to start working on blending this in. The first thing we can do is add a diffuse BSDF into our graph and hook this up to the surface output. And the reason we're processing this through the BSDF is because the raw image on its own won't interact with the lighting. And since we now have a reliable representation of what the logo will look like, this is a good time to add some color correction. One way we can do this is by adding in a hue saturation node and use the hue slider to match the shade and then the value slider to match the brightness. And now we can combine everything together using a mix node with our logo BSDF in the foreground and the image alpha as the mixing factor. This overlays all our shaders in the correct order, but it's still missing some imperfections that can really enhance this material. So let's add in a Musgrave texture and also a math node set to multiply with our image alpha and the factor from the Musgrave as inputs. And effectively what this does is mix in our logo shader using some variability from our Musgrave. We can increase the Musgrave scale to get a finer pattern, and to lower the intensity of this effect, we can duplicate over another math node set to subtract with our previous math node as the second input and the alpha as our first. We then also need to duplicate another math node to our chain set to multiply. And what this setup is doing is taking our image alpha and subtracting away Musgrave contained inside the logo scaled by our multiplication. And I know this setup may be a bit confusing, but you can see what happens when we change the value of our multiplier. Finally, the last detail we need to account for is the metal grill on the bottom panel. So for this, let's add another material slot with the metal we made from before loaded. And since we just want to use our metal shader as a foundation for the grill, we're going to create a new material for this which we'll rename to grill. So basically what we're going to be doing with this is creating a lattice of circles that will have interact with our metal. And while making this, it will be super helpful to see our material on a simple mesh. So just add in a plane oriented to our view, position and scale it next to our hell model, and apply our grill material. So anytime we edit our grill shader, we'll be referring to our new plane to see what's going on. And we can begin by adding a gradient texture node which we'll set to spherical to get started with making our circles. And just like all the other times, we see our gradient isn't centered on the plane. To fix this, hit Ctrl T to add in our texture coordinates and mapping nodes and switch from generated to UV coordinates. And this time we're going to use the mapping node method to center our gradient. So all we need to do is shift our origin to the middle of the plane, which we can do by changing our X and Y locations to minus 0.5. And this does exactly what we wanted, but clearly our spherical gradient is way too big and we don't want there to be any fall off. And a nice way to fix all these problems is with a color ramp node with the interpolation set to constant. This is not only going to give us a crisp edge, but we can also control the radius of the circle by sliding over our white handle. Now obviously our goal is going to be to make this circular pattern repeat in a way that looks like a grill, which is something that's pretty difficult to do completely procedurally. So I'm going to be showing you an easier method, but if you want the very mathematical approach, I'm going to add some extra footage at the end of the video. The method we're going to use involves creating one tile of this pattern, which will then bake into a texture and have it repeat. So to create our tile, all we have to do is have one of these circles in one corner and a duplicate of it in the opposite corner. So let's set our X and Y locations to minus 0.75, which will slide our gradient over to the top right corner. We can then use our color ramp node to bring the radius down so it's barely contained inside our plane. Now to create the duplicate, we can just copy over our nodes and with this mapping node, we'll set the X and Y locations to minus 0.25. So now we have a circle in both the top right and the bottom left, and we can combine these by adding in a math node set to add with both of these as inputs. And the way baking works in Blender is we always need to have a destination image for our bake texture. So let's add an image texture node and create a new image that we can call dots using the default 1024 by 1024 resolution. And with this node selected, head over to the render tab and under the bake dropdown, just hit bake. This will take a bit of time to process, but when it's done, hover over the UV editor window and hit shift S to save out our bake texture. And now that we've created our dots texture, we can delete the reference plane and head back into our base. We no longer need the nodes used to create the dots, and for this I'm also going to delete all the nodes we used for our scratches. Now when we hook up the image texture node to our viewer, you can see that nothing is showing up, and this is because we still need to assign our grill material. To fix this, just toggle over to edit mode, select the bottom end gone, and with our grill material selected, hit assign material. So now when we hit control T and bring up our scale sliders, we're getting the repeated texture that looks exactly like what we're going for. And using our reference, we want to just keep adjusting our scale until the grid dots are about the same size. Now incorporating this into our metal shader is extremely easy. We're just going to add an invert node with 
with our texture as the input, which makes our dots black and everything else white. We then want to plug this into our base color, metallic, and the height socket and the bump node, which will reset to a strength of 1. Lastly, for our roughness, we're going to hook up the non-inverted texture and bring in a math node set to add with the value of 0.6. And essentially, this is just giving the dots a roughness of 1 and everything else a roughness of 0.6, which is what we had originally for our roughness. And that was actually the last of the materials, so we can finally go back to the layout workspace to finish off with a bit of lighting. So I know we spent a disproportionate amount of time shading, but now all that hard work will finally begin to pay off as we light our space. And lighting is the step where we really want to inject some kind of mood into our scene. In this case, I want to go for a very creepy type of feel because that's really what the HAL 9000 is all about. So let's start off by getting rid of our reference, and then we can take our area light and bring it back to the world origin. And I want to use this light to illuminate our model from above, which in the rendered view already looks very cinematic. And I really want to play into the creepiness factor by adding some what I would consider sinister lighting from below. So just duplicate over the area light and position it under the mesh so that it's oriented upwards. And to make Hal look more evil, we can change the color of this light to a fairly soft red, and we want to make sure we lower the intensity a bit. So already we've kind of hit on the mood we want to get out of this, and now we just want to add in some extra details. For example, we can take the top area light and bring it slightly forward so that we get a clearer view of this mesh and we have our metal reflection where we want them. And another thing we can do is add some volumetrics to really give this scene a sense of depth. To do that, just add in a cube and scale it up really big so we're viewing the inside of it, and then head over to the shading tab where we can create a new material that we'll call volume. And we can swap out our principled BSDF for a principled volume shader, which we hook up to the volume material output. And the reason we can't see anything right now is because our volume is very dense so light isn't passing through it. To fix this, we can just bring down our density, and now we have our volumetric lighting illuminating howl. And you just want to play around with the principled volume properties until you're happy with how much light is passing through the volume. And that's essentially the entire setup for our scene. So when we render at a high enough sample count, we end up getting this final render which in my opinion really captures what we were going for. And yeah, we pretty much accomplished what we set out to do. We went through the whole process of modeling, unwrapping, shading, and lighting. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial, it took me a really long time to edit this whole thing together, and initially is only supposed to be around 15 minutes long, but there was just way too much to cover. So I hope you learned something, and if you want to fund more high-quality tutorials like these, consider checking out my Patreon. There are of course a ton of benefits like behind-the-scenes content and access to the scripts I write for these videos before I record them. But that's all I have for you guys today, so I'll see you in the next one.